I suppose after having looked at the building for quite a number of years, the price of property in the market in Georgetown had slowly moved up over the you know, prevailing few years. So it wasn't looking too bad in terms of value. And uh, there were a lot of interest in Georgetown because you know, the World Heritage Site had been inscribed over the past few years. So I think that at that stage, I was still very interested in acquiring um, properties in the heritage zone. So when the broker rang me up and said, it's going to be this week, the property is going to be sold because there are other parties interested in making an offer. I said to myself, okay, I think I should do it. I will give the owner what he wanted for the price of the property because I wanted it to stay in um, the hands of a Penang owner. And uh, it was accept accepted. The, the, the offer was accepted, but I offered them what they wanted anyway. So, uh, you know, at that time, I had quite a few projects on my hands. So it was a bit of a big bite to swallow, but I still was committed to doing this property. I suppose the building inspired the design and the concept. Um, so, you know, I didn't have this concept in mind walking around every day around Georgetown waiting for a building to eventuate. There was a very long natural space for a courtyard in the seven terraces, and which is the central focus for the whole building. And I think that was inspired by the traditional. Um, si he Yuan or the courtyard house in in Beijing. You see a lot of those courtyard houses in the Hutongs. And I think that my previous uh, hotel project in Gaul was very much centered around a courtyard as well. So originally the pool was meant to be in the central courtyard, but I felt that the noise and the echo from people having a good time in the pool would disturb the sleep of the guests. So we moved the pool to the, the um, other extreme of the building. So that's how the design came about, you know, the basically around the courtyard house and around the structure of the building. The inspiration was always to preserve and maintain Peranakan culture for future generations. I think the decline of uh, Peranakan culture after the Second World War was very um, obvious and uh, it became a curiosity. So my vision was always to recreate the gilded, the gilded and the golden age of Peranakan culture, which I thought was in the 1920s. So after 10 years later, any thoughts or regrets? I don't believe in regrets, but um, no, I think that it's looked better with age. And I think that um, the layers I've added over the years has made the place look richer and uh, a bit more complex. When I first acquired it and I first fitted it out, even though I thought I had a lot of um, furniture and things that could go into the interiors, the place absorbed so much stuff that it did look quite sparse at the opening. When I look back at the photographs, it did look quite sparse. But now, you know, as layers have been added over time, paintings, um, textiles, more antiques. It does look like it's been here for ever. <laughs> Would you do, do it again? You know, I never repeat myself, but <laughs> I don't like repeating myself. But I think having 
the benefit of hindsight, I probably wouldn't. But as I said, I have no regrets and I'm glad to have put so much of myself into this place. And uh, it's a great archive for Peranakan treasures, heritage and uh, antiques. And uh, having done it and having put so much love and uh, consciousness and uh, effort into it, I think that it would be a shame if the public did not come to enjoy it. The whole purpose of this is to preserve Peranakan culture for posterity. And there's no point in preserving it if it's not enjoyed by the current and future generations of people.